Cornell Hall was Secretary of State. And he called me on Saturday morning around 9.30 and asked if I could come over to see him. I came over, well, didn't live far from there, and he met me out in front of the State Department, the old State Department. And we were walking towards the White House. And he mentioned that he had something very important to talk to. And we wanted to sit down. And we walked across the street to Lafayette Park, sat on the bench, and he started to relate that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Specifically, he emphasized December the 7th. And that he wanted me to know because I had helped him on other issues that if anything should erupt against him that uh, he would be protected by a friend which I have been to him and uh, he then related and pulled out of his pocket the, the transcript which stated specifically that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Lieb gave his exclusive to the United Press who put it only on the foreign wire. Ironically, the only paper to use it was the Honolulu Advertiser. In its watered-down form, it was not a story that caused Joseph Rochefort undue concern. At one point, we seem to have a, a sort of a freezing of the mind, which I sometimes refer to as mental paralysis, because our reasoning went something like this, that if the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, then this means war. War with the United States is going to be won by the United States. So therefore, why should the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? And the answer is they don't. But that Sunday, a whole week before the attack, Admiral Kimmel questioned another intercept. Radio signals from several oil tankers, one of Japan's newest aircraft carriers, and a battleship had all now been intercepted. But intelligence put none of them where they really were, nearly a thousand miles out into the North Pacific. That night in Bandung, Java, General Chair Porton revealed the threat of the Japanese fleet to the American liaison officer, Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe. He told Thorpe Pearl Harbor was one of four possible targets. General DeFortin, the commander of the Dutch Army, wasn't sure about it. He hadn't known me too long. Whether or not I really had sent that message. So he got a copy of the same message and sent it to the uh, military attaché at the Dutch Embassy in Washington. And Colonel Wireman, who was the Dutch uh, attaché in Washington, realized how important it was. So he took it in person to General George Marshall, who was then Chief of Staff of the Army. And Marshall re read this intercept and turned to Wyoming and said, do you expect me to believe this stuff? So that was the way all I just, and I sent three more dispatches. And finally I got a cable back saying, don't send us any more, we're not interested. When the Japanese Foreign Office finally told its diplomats the American conditions were impossible to meet, Washington listened in to every word. A few days earlier, the Matson Line steamship SS Lurleen had passed under the Golden Gate Bridge bound for Honolulu. Crowded with more defense personnel than civilians, the liner was on her regular weekly run. 
As the liner came within three days' steaming distance of the island, the ship's radio operator began to pick up a faint signal which he could not identify. Leslie E. Grogan, one of the Matson Line's most experienced operators, began to log the signals. As the ship got closer to Honolulu, Grogan began to make out the letters of JCS, Yokohama. He informed his captain that the signals were coming from northwest of Honolulu. Grogan's intercepts were only one of the series of clues now coming in from all over the world. In Singapore, one message would have been intercepted which must have caused great interest in London. It was a prearranged signal for attack. Deciphered, it ordered the battle force to strike on December 8th, Tokyo time. It would be 24 hours earlier in Honolulu. Pearl Harbor was now only five days away. Down the west coast of America, from Alaska to San Diego, Navy and commercial radio stations had been alerted to listen for unfamiliar signals coming from the Pacific. In secret rooms and secret stations, operators, who normally only transmitted, now strained to pick up intercepts from a mostly empty ocean. Their intercepts were all brought to 717 Market Street. San Francisco, where Hosner watched as they were plotted with great care on a great circle chart of the North Pacific by his young colleague, Robert Ogg. The two men were aware of the importance of their work and that their information was needed immediately in Washington. During his second night on duty, Grogan again logged the signals coming from northwest of Honolulu. He was making a concise record to give to naval intelligence when the Lurleen arrived there the following day. The stations along the Pacific coast were still picking up intercepts. They were good enough for Og and Hosner to get a positive fix on the Japanese fleet, still keeping well north across the Pacific. Later that day, Japanese diplomats around the world were told to destroy all their secret codes. Nave, on duty in Melbourne, was handed the intercept. And I took this down to show, because this was something that was really final, uh, it, it was finality about it, took this down to show the Chief of Naval Staff, who was in Canberra, for a War Cabinet meeting. And I saw his deputy, Commodore Durnford, and uh, he said, this is an important piece of information, Nave. Yes, sir. Is how, how long do you think we've got? And I, it's a matter of days, I think, um, possibly probably the weekend. And he got hold of his microphone in his office and he rang Canberra word to get the Admiral who was up there at his war cabinet. On December 3rd, a visitor arrived at the Navy Department in Washington. Johan Raneft, naval attaché at the Dutch Embassy, was a well-known face at the Office of Naval Intelligence. But on this occasion, he was intrigued by a detail of secret information he was allowed to see. Symbols on a chart indicated that two carriers had left Japan on an easterly course across the Pacific. In his diary, Raneft expressed no element of surprise at this information, despite the fact that at the State Department the previous day, he had been told the situation with Japan was not immediately dangerous. At Pearl Harbor, Admiral Kimmel might have been less anxious if he had also been told about the Japanese carriers. It was a question he kept putting to Edwin Layton, his staff intelligence officer. Layton had studied all Rossport summaries, but he could give Kimmel no accurate information when he was repeatedly questioned. What? You don't know where the carriers are? 
No, sir. 